everyone and welcome. My name is Kelsey Kramer and I'm the program manager in the 92nd Street Wise Belfer Center for Innovation and Social Impact. Thank you for joining us. 92Y is proud to present tonight's conversation with Now This. Thank you to the entire team at Now This for making tonight's event possible. This evening's conversation on turning out the youth vote is our final event in 92Y's campaign for 100%. For the past six weeks, we've hosted a series of virtual events that explore how voting impacts individual lives, communities, our government, and society as a whole. Please visit 92y.org backslash campaign for 100 to learn more and watch previous events in the series. As a community center, your participation is very important to us. We have folks joining from many different platforms tonight so please submit your questions in the comments section of whatever platform you're viewing on and they will get to our panelists. And now it is my honor to introduce our guests, guests for the, tonight's conversation on turning out the youth vote. A look at what's animating young people to turn out to the polls in 2020 and beyond. Jamira Burley is an activist and self-proclaimed millennial youth whisperer. She was National Deputy Millennial Vote Director for Hillary for America, recognized by the Obama White House as a champion of change and a Forbes under 30 honoree in law and policy. Currently, she serves as Head of Youth Engagement and Skills at Global Business Coalition for Education. Abby Kisa is Director of Impact at Circle, a national research institute that focuses on youth civic learning and engagement especially among those who have been marginalized in, a, in political life. Circle's research informs policy and practice for healthier youth development and a more inclusive democracy, and is part of the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University. Zach Malamed is the co-founder and executive director of The Next 50, where he works to make politics accessible to a new generation of donors and candidates. He's also the founder and former executive director of Student Voice, which organizes high school students to advocate for equity in education. And our final panelist, Quill Robinson, is vice president of government affairs at, Mer at, at American Conservation Coalition. Founded in 2017 by a group of millennials, it's, it's dedicated, dedicated to mobilizing young people around environmental action through common sense, market-based and limited government ideals. Through his work with ACC, he connects students with their representatives in Washington to turn ACC's bold vision into real policy solutions. And our moderator for tonight, Ethan Stephanopoulos, president of Now This, the number one mobile news brand in the United States. Now This has a singular mission, to make news engaging and relevant for young adults by humanizing our complicated world. And now I will turn it over to Ethan to get us started. Thank you so much. Second Street Y for organizing this incredible series. Uh, we here at Now This couldn't be more excited to be partnering with them tonight uh, on tonight's final panel, as Kelsey said, turning out the youth vote. Uh, and welcome to all of you who are joining, on, uh, joining us online. As Kelsey mentioned, we're gonna be pulling in questions throughout the hour from those watching. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So please submit your questions uh, throughout the evening. And as you heard from the introduction, we have an incredible group of individuals gathered to discuss the topic of the youth vote. We're going to break up the hour uh, across three key areas. We're going to be talking about the issues that are driving young people to the polls. We want to talk about the turnout uh, of young people in this upcoming election. And then looking forward, where do we see youth engagement going post-election? So with that, a little bit of a backdrop, we to just going to set the stage. And one thing we saw and know that in the 2018 midterms, that was the first time that we actually saw millennials and Gen Z become the largest voting bloc, uh, surpassing baby boomers. Um, and so before you know, we move forward, I really think that we're only eight days out, as everybody knows, uh, of this uh, impending election, the most consequential election that we hear over and over of our lifetime. You know, there's some really interesting statistics that we're seeing as of today. Um, as many of you may have heard, as of today, 60 million voters have cast their, their vote in this election, which has already surpassed the 58 million people who voted early or by mail in 2016. But more uh, particularly, in the early uh, vote, we're seeing 
uh, a surge across youth votes, both in terms of voter registration and those doing early vote from the 18 to 29 year old demographic. I just heard a statistic just the other day too that I thought was really compelling as we kind of set the ground for this conversation. That is 63% of all those under the age of 30 who have already voted this year did not vote in 2016. So it gives you a sense of this real um, moment in which young people are truly showing up. So with that uh, kind of set, I wanna kind of pose the first question to the whole group um, in terms of big picture. What do you think that young voters, especially now those who have registered and demonstrated their enthusiasm and interest leading up to this election, what do they need to know before sending in their ballots or voting in person early or on election day in these final days? Uh, and maybe what we'll do is I'll start with you, Jumeirah. I knew that was coming to me first. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion and shout out to everyone who's watching. Um, what I will say is that I think what's interesting about this specific election and the young people who are already participating is that they're already feeling a deep sense of collective responsibility, um, a collective responsibility not only for the communities that they come from, but also for other communities that have been directly impacted by a range of different issues that have happened over the last few years, but also that are indicative of what this country stands for. Um, and I think for young people who are still trying to either figure out if they're gonna show up on election day if they have all the right information is to one, not be afraid to ask stupid, quote unquote, stupid questions, right? We wanna ensure that every person shows up to the ballot box informed and ready to vote. And that means finding out what are the specific regulations in your state, and then also being being willing to have very difficult conversations with the people in your life about the very issues that you feel directly impacted by and also issues that you feel like are going to truly define what this country stands for and what other young people are going to show up and, and vote for. Zach, I'm going to come to you. And for those who are watching, yet your eyes are not deceiving you. Zach is in a car. Um, <laughs> Zach, same question to you. Calling me out. So I'm in the great swing state of Maine right now. Uh, I see a Trump sign next to a Biden sign from my car. And this is the only place where I could get service. But that is kind of uh, the moment that we're in right now um, over here. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to this election, um, you know, the thing that I, I think most young people really need to think about, we're so wrapped up in the presidential election, but there are so many other really consequential down ballot races. You know, what's at stake in our country this cycle? Uh, we don't just have a presidential election. We have a Senate election. We know that that's going to shape who's going to be able to confirm, be confirmed for appointments in the next administration, whoever wins this election. We also have state legislature races that are extraordinarily consequential, especially this year, because we are in the center here. Uh, and with a census comes the opportunity for redistricting next cycle. We all hope for fair and equitable redistricting processes, but those redistricting processes will be shaped by the parties in power in our, in our respective states. Uh, and so we really need to prioritize that because that will sway the balance of power for the next decade. Uh, redistricting, for those who, who are less familiar, is, is the process where uh, every years we evaluate the the the, the population in our country and, and draw the lines uh, for Congress and state legislatures uh, that make sure that our community is fairly represented based on population size. Um, the second thing though, is that the election isn't the be all end all. Like we have work to do after the election. Uh, if you're voting for a candidate because you care about climate change, you care about uh, you know criminal justice reform, uh, you care about uh, ending gun violence in our country, that work doesn't, end with voting for a candidate. It actually starts once the, those candidates are elected. Uh, so yes, we're all tired and exhausted and it feels like the longest election ever, uh, but the work is truly just beginning. But hopefully we take a little break afterwards because we're all putting a lot of work in right now. Yeah, you're right. Abby, uh, same question to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Kelsey and Julie and now this for hosting this. And I also want to appreciate the 90 second wise goal, this framework for the conversation of reaching 100% because what we've seen in our research over the past 20 years are that issues of equitable access to elections and voting is a much larger challenge amongst young people than is this myth of youth apathy. Um, and specifically related to your question, Ethan, you know, there's a couple of things that I think come up regularly in our research that I want to uplift. The first is young people feeling not qualified enough to participate in a conversation, right, and to vote. That's something that we actually hear more often 
um, than some people might think. Um, but all the young folks out there, you have a right to vote. Um, and there's guides out there that can help you. There's folks in your life who can help you. Um, and there's ways to sift through all the media that you may you know, feel overwhelmed by. But you have a right to do that um, regardless of you know, anything else. The second thing I want to I want to uplift too is that the pandemic has adjusted so many state processes and procedures, where your polling location might be, all of which is significantly important and reiterates the need to talk about concrete information with young folks. But even before this, there were challenging procedures, you know, and states, and we can't make assumptions about young people knowing some of those laws and policies. So to the young people out there, don't make assumptions about your eligibility to vote or you know, whether or not you need um, a voter ID. Look it up. Because one of the things that we found is that young people assume often stricter laws um, about their disenfranchisement or their eligibility or some of the state laws. And so people should be checking and making sure because we need more diverse voices in part of our democracy. And that's one of the things that's holding young people back. Thank you. And there's a, you've brought up a number of things that I know we will uh, get to throughout the hour in terms of how do we actually inform uh, young people to how to check and what's the best ways to get this information. But uh, Quill, I'll throw it to you as the kind of final rounded out uh, opening question. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me today. I think I want to, you know, just elaborate a little bit on actually a point that Zach brought up about voting up ballot and all the way down the ballot. Something I, I hear from a lot of my peers is that they, they don't quite fit into either you know the Democrat category or the Republican category. And that's that's something I think is really backed up by um, data about Gen Z and millennials. And I think that um, you know I'm I'm a I'm a conservative. I also am a climate activist. And so you could sort of see how there might be a little bit of a disconnect at the top of the ballot there. Um, but what's really important here is that by voting for state legislature, um, by voting for members of Congress, um, by looking at those issues that are down the ballot, those candidates are down the ballot, we're actually shaping the future of the parties. And so, you know, I think that that's a, that's a message that I really want to communicate to young people today is that, you know, maybe if you don't fit, you know, I, I think some people, sometimes we bring up the issue of, you know, what if there is a different, if, what if you're not in a two party system, but we want to change the two parties that are the two parties that are, are that exist right now. The way we do it is vote for candidates, particularly down ballot who will emerge as the future leaders in those parties. And so that that's kind of, you know, one of the main things that's on my mind and something that uh, I hope that, you know, most young people can uh, can keep in mind as they're looking at their ballots. Great. So I thought what we'll do is we'll turn the conversation to the to the issues. You know, I, I can speak uh, from the uh, vantage point of now this. You know, we've seen for many, many years that when we cover from a news angle, the issues that are impacting young people you know, and it's a little bit, it'll, it'll kind, of, kind of turn to the question, Abby, for you, is that there's been this perception that young people are apathetic towards uh, politics about the world around them. And we see it from a news perspective that, in fact, they're deeply engaged. They care about these issues. They're leaning in. Um, so I actually want to start with you in terms of the research you've done. You've done a tremendous amount of research, how nuanced it is about how young voters are being driven by specific issues, really not seeing themselves to be either liberal or conservative, but rather what are the issues that are driving them? So tell us a little bit more what you found in your research on the issues that are driving young people to the polls. Yeah, and one of the things that I think we have to acknowledge when we're talking about the wide range of issues that young people care about is that sometimes there's this confusion and stereotyping of young people, when in fact there's immense amounts of diversity amongst young people. So for example, before the pandemic, only 35% of 18 to 23 year olds were enrolled in college, many on community college campuses. Some are parents, some are immigrants, many have immigrant parents. And this is all relevant because our research and experience over many election cycles shows that young people are more likely to vote when they see how elections connect to their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And actually in early summer this year, we heard from 79% of 18 and 29 year olds that the pandemic has helped them see that decisions that elected officials make affects their everyday lives. And this is why so many youth organizations talk about issues so much because they found and so have we that young people are motivated by impact and the desire for change on these issues that affect them, people who they love, their families. And so the issues young people are prioritizing can differ. You know, when we when we 
talked to folks early summer, people were talking about racial justice, people were talking about the environment, climate change, and especially the affordability of and accessibility of family health care. Um, but when you look more deeply at the data, you see even bigger differences. So youth of color are prioritizing racial, racial justice, black youth are prioritizing issues with policing in communities, and amongst the group who we talked to, young people who were supportive of President Trump, really want to go back to what they would call pre-coronavirus normal. Um, but ultimately, Athen, you're totally right that young people are motivated by issues and they want to see change on those issues. Yep. Actually, it, it, your comment there really actually connects to, you know, I was doing a little research, obviously, in spending a little time getting to know each of the panelists here. And Jameer, I saw a video that you had uh, online that you were in. You said to me what was a very profound statement of that, you said you've become an expert in your own experience, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's a, a really profound way to kind of encapsulate how young people uh, identify the, the world around them through their own experiences and what is driving them to get involved politically or being motivated uh, by the issues that are, to your point, Abby, impacting them directly. So uh, my question, Jamira, for you is, you know, obviously in, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and kind of this, the, the racial and social injustice awakening that we saw across the country, how do you think these events have motivated not only black and brown communities, but all marginalized communities to get more involved in the political process? No, that's a great question. I have to say, um, after the death, um, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, the protest looked very different than it did four years ago when I was protesting in Baton Rouge in Baltimore, right before I joined um, the Hillary campaign, mostly because a lot of those protests in Harlem and ones I saw around the country had allies who physically put their bodies on the line um, in, in conflict with police to ensure that they didn't harm the protesters of color. That being said, I think we're at a reckoning within this country where folks are finally realizing that the fight for racial justice doesn't just end or begin with police brutality, but it's a recognition of how the government has deliberately or, indeliber or indirectly um, in structured entire policies, platforms, and communities around the limitations of folks of color. And so when you see folks, particularly young people out on the streets using their voices, using their platforms, I think to, I said, to a point I said earlier, it's an understanding that they can't have liberation unless everyone has liberation, including people who don't look like them. And I think that's the, um, the stories that you're hearing from young people who, for the first time and for many generations, the first time where they're interacting with people from a range of different backgrounds and communities that they can't no longer hide behind, um, you know, what they're seeing on the news when the reality is within their friend group and within their college roommates, um, totally different than what um, main, mainstream media has told them. So it's an interesting moment within this history that I think is being led mostly by young people who feel like they don't want to have children. They don't want to build a future in a, in a society that doesn't welcome all of us. And follow-up question to you and then to the larger group as a whole is, do you think that what we've seen over the past six months, the energy that we're seeing out on the streets, will that convert to, to young people truly showing up and, and making their voices heard, whatever issue it is that's really kind of driving them? I hope so. Um, and I say that because, you know, I think young people are very disillusioned with the political process, right? They're disheartened by the fact that they feel like their life hasn't changed and they feel like politicians are not speaking on behalf of them. But I also think that this generation, um, or I feel like this moment is very different than 2016 because we now have, young people now have an example of what the country can look like if they don't utilize their vote. And so what we're going to see in many ways, young people showing up and showing out loudly. Um, and we see it in all forms a platform, how they're educating each other, using everything from TikTok to Twitter to Instagram to being able to talk about the issues in a real in-depth and complex way. Zach, any thoughts on that, about what we're seeing over the past few months and, and how that might convert into to young people showing up? Well, I have two thoughts on this. One is, you know, oftentimes we talk about what we're, there's a lot to be afraid of right now in our country, right? There's a lot that people are fearful of. And so often what, what happens when we message to, to voters in general is that we talk about that fear and we talk about what we need to prevent and we don't talk about what we hope for and what we desire. And, and actually on a, on a prior campaign that I worked for, when we looked at our, uh, the data around the videos that we put out there, uh, we saw very clearly that young voters did not react at all to preventative uh, advertising, preventative messaging, they react overwhelmingly positively to 
aspirational messages. We need a vision for our country. We need a vision for what young people's future will look like. And, and Jameer started to hint at some of those ideas that, that are out there. I mean, we need to fight for, for justice and equality and, we, and that needs to be front and center. We need a vision, not just about how we're gonna prevent climate change, how we're gonna end the fire. We need to talk about, you know, what does a green economy look like and how is that gonna create jobs for Americans? That's an aspirational message. Um, the second thought though is, we talk a lot about how we're going to turn young people out to vote. And I think that there is a, there's a lot of privilege in the idea of saying, like, we're going to turn you out to vote. We're going to get you out to vote. Uh, but then we're going to kind of like, you know, go away for the next three years until we need you again. Mm -hmm. We need electeds that are going to show up for young people uh, over the next four years. And when Jameer talked about this disillusionment, like it stems from the fact that they'll show up for young people right before election day. Say, we need you. Uh, but then they'll go away and then they'll blame young people for not showing up the next time. Uh, uh, you know, the last thing I'll say, and this is more on the, on the partisan streak, but uh, you know, for liberals, uh, between 2008 and two, 2014, we know that uh, they invested uh, 500 million less or three times, as, uh, three times less than conservatives uh, in their youth organizations. Uh, we saw actually the results of that and the fact that over the course of the next handful of elections up until 2018, uh, conservatives actually increased their share of young voters. And that happened cycle after cycle. What happened in, in 2018, though? We saw the, the shooting in Parkland and we saw how young people rose up and were invested in, heavily invested in, uh, to do this work and to organize their peers around coming out to vote. We saw historic turnout among young people in the midterm elections. That happens when we invest in young people continuously, sustainably. Not it doesn't end on election day. It must continue. Otherwise, you know, young people are are going to continue to be disillusioned by our politics uh, and not realize, not believe that there's much to aspire for because they won't be listened to. Yeah. And Quill, I'm going to pick up uh, on a little bit of what Zach was saying earlier about the the aspirational nature of motivating young people, and. You know, again, looking at it through the lens of now this, if, I, if we were to say of all the issues that we've covered as a news outlet for young people, um, no surprise, climate change and sustainability has always been uh, the number one issue in terms of young people, no matter what side of the aisle you, you define yourself on. And so obviously, you know, you mentioned early, earlier, you're a conservative who cares about the environment. Um, and so my question to you is, you know, specifically on climate change, you know, how are you seeing this as one of the most central issues for young people today that they are collectively aligned on, independent of their broader politics. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess, you know, one thing I want to say before I dive into climate change is that I actually see a similar thing on, on racial justice issues. Um, among my peers, you know, conservatives, folks on the right side of the aisle, young people, they were out marching. They, they were there. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's something that's often lost in the narrative around it being sort of a red blue issue, but among my peers, you know, on the right side of the aisle, I think that there is a huge, huge um, awareness that this is a serious problem. And it's something that we want to address. And, you know, perhaps some of the, the, the you know, the, the way it's approached might look a little bit different, but that's something that I, I think is such an important story to tell. On, on the issue of climate change, Ethan, you're exactly right. I mean, climate change is a generational issue. It's not a, it's not a partisan issue. Um, among uh, you know, among young Republican voters, I mean, we did a poll on this recently, and we found that um, you know, an overwhelming majority of young Republican voters are um, not, not only do they care about the issue, but we found that 85% of, uh, of Republican voters between the ages of 18 and uh, 54 are more likely to vote for a Republican candidate who has an innovative uh, approach to climate change. And so what we're seeing here is that, you know, not only is it an acceptance of the issue and an understanding it's something we need to address, but we're holding our, uh, you know, our representatives accountable. And I think that's, a you know, another story I want to bring up is that um, you know, over this last year, you know, although there's not been a bit of a big shift in the White House necessarily in Congress, there's been a huge amount of activism among young Republicans pushing um, senators and representatives to take on this issue. We've actually seen a shift in the in you know how this is discussed and sort of the the willingness to address it. And so um, that, I think that's kind of like the the dark horse success story of the last uh, year or the last couple of years is that on the right of center young voters, young people have been doing the steady activism that, uh, that has shifted the issue. And so that's, that's something that's really exciting to me and gives me a, a lot of optimism. I guess the final thing I'll say on this is that a lot of the narrative on climate change is doom and gloom. When I hear a young person say that they don't want to have kids because of the issue of climate change, 
that's awful. I mean, that, that, you know, having children is the most optimistic thing you can do. That's an investment in the future. And if somebody is saying, if people in my generation, a lot of people in my generation feel that it's not worth bringing a child into this world, that's really concerning. And so I think that, you know, something that I'm trying to do and what my organization does is, you know, accept the significance of this issue and the problem that we're facing, but focus on optimism. And, and young people respond to that really well because we're entrepreneurial, we're innovative, and we're ready to get to work on the issue. Yeah, it's, it, you, your uh, point there is something that I think resonates you know, directly with us at Now This. You know, we know in covering this issue for young people, simply coming at it from the doom and gloom is, you know, it's the glass is half empty versus half full. Mm -hmm. You know, we've even looked at it. We actually developed a series called One Small Step, which is really trying to say, what are the actions young people can take in their everyday lives to actually, you know, have an impact? Uh, on the world around them. So even from a media perspective, right, and the communication perspective, is how do you drive this narrative that, you know, you have the ability to drive this forward without it feeling like an overwhelming uh, crisis that you have no impact on in your in your daily life. Um, the, the one question I'm going to go back to you, Zach, actually, is the other topic that I, I find really interesting as it relates to the issues and how young people, I think, not even now, but even on a go-forward basis, is going to be looking around election reform, right? And I know that you had done uh, a, a panel recently with um, uh, the Attorney General, the former Attorney General, on the census, and, and kind of just looking at you know, gerrymandering as a whole, how we're looking at our elections, how young people are informed about how our elections work, both engaging them today in the 2020 election and beyond. You know, what are you seeing uh, in terms of, you know, the concept of election reform getting traction amongst young people post, you know, November 3rd? Uh, well, I, so I think that there's a there's a big opportunity here. Young people understand that two out of the last three presidents uh, were not elect were were, ele were elected without having a, a popular vote victory, uh, and so they're frustrated by that fact. Uh, but I'd also take a step back and say, like, this is also about the Constitution itself. You know, that panel we really touched upon. What does the Constitution say? And Truth be told, the last significant constitutional amendment uh, was lowering the voting age from 21 to 18, uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, and so that that was about expanding young people's access, uh, their right to vote. Uh, but still to this day, there are many young people in this country who find it difficult to vote, which I know Abby can speak to and, and Jamira can speak to quite well. Um, I'll speak per from my own personal experience. When I was in college, it was the middle of Hurricane Sandy. A lot of the stores were closed. I didn't know where to go to find a stamp. And so I couldn't submit my absentee ballot. Um, and so that, that that gets to like a lot of the electoral electoral reform uh, that needs to take place. Young people see this, but they don't fully understand that the system is set up such that like our, 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 our rights and our, our votes would be suppressed. Um, I think there's an appetite, but there's also a lack of understanding. So we need to do more on that front for it to become a front and center issue with young people. Uh, ahead of issues like climate change and, and gun safety uh, and racial justice. Well, you, you mentioned it's a, a good transition, actually, as we move to you know talking about turnout. And um, actually, I'm going to come back to you, Abby, is, you know, historically, we have seen younger people vote at lower rates than older adults. That is beginning to change from what we can tell. Um, what trends are you seeing both kind of historically over the past couple of elections. What are you seeing this year? But also the other question I want to uh, add into it is what barrier, because we've seen record numbers of voter registration in 2020, but what barriers do young people face in terms of actually voting even after they've registered to vote? Yeah, thanks so much. We absolutely have to start this conversation um, about previous elections by acknowledging the fact that, you know, the oldest members of Gen Z and the youngest millennials set records in 2018 with the highest ever youth midterm turnout since the voting age, speaking of the 26th Amendment, since the voting age was lowered to 18. And this was largely because of young people's leadership. We saw that year where young people were mobilizing other young people. And we're also seeing that this year, where young people are making the election about their future and mobilizing others along the way, especially young women of color. And part of this is working to register other young people to vote. And as you just said, we're seeing numbers of young people registered to vote in higher numbers than right before the 20th 
2016 election. Um, in at least 20 states, and more on this if you're interested tomorrow, um, we're also seeing far more young people vote early or absentee in key states compared to similar points in 2016. In Florida, it, you know, it's almost six times more um, as of the middle of last week. In North Carolina, it's eight times more. And in Michigan, a place where the margin of victory was like 11,000 votes in 2016, we're seeing 10 times more young people cast early and absentee ballots. Um, but beyond this election, you know, you mentioned barriers. There's an incredible amount that we can do to increase and support more equitable youth voter turnout. And to, too often, in, in my experience with this, media, talking heads, pundits set this high bar that when they're talking about youth voter turnout, you know, they don't believe young people are gonna impact an election unless their turnout increases like something ridiculous, like 50 points. But then they also don't support young people and then criticize them for not turning out. So the most important thing we can actually do is set up systems that support young people. So this isn't all on youth leadership, every single election cycle. And you know, to to Zach's point about you know going away for three years and coming back, um, that resonates so much with what I've seen election cycle to election cycle. And so one of the things that we believe we can do to reduce barriers to young people is starting earlier by using a framework called growing voters. And instead of waiting until the last three months before election to cram for a test, we can actually start talking to young people about their expertise on issues, what they care about in their community, and how they can lead and contribute way before they reach 18. Jamira, any other thoughts on that in terms of barriers you've seen? Yeah, well, first I will say is that, you know, when people talk about youth turnout and how it's been low um, for millennials and Gen Zs, they never look at the fact that that's actually generational, right? Youth voters, when they first start out, are rarely at 100%. Um, oftentimes, voters only become serious voters once they become homeowners. And we don't know how long that's going to take for Gen Z and millennials considering the current economy. But what I will say in regards to barriers is that, I would agree with a lot of what has been said is that it's so hard for young people to see the correlation of why they should turn out to vote when they don't understand how specific candidates might impact specific issues or specific ways of lives within their communities. And we have to get back to teaching civics in school. We have to get back to actually creating pathways for young people to understand the political process, to know why everyone from their block captain to their city council member to their state rep, all of them matter. And they all have different roles and responsibilities versus like ensuring, expecting young people to know everything on day one and to be able to turn out and be an informed voter at the same time. I also will say is that, you know, beyond voting, young people are still making change in and outside their communities because to what Zach said, voting isn't the end all be all. And I think we have to find ways to um, engage those young people who are making impact, who are seen as influencers within their co individual communities and use them as a, a launch pad to continue to engage young people who care about those specific issues, but more importantly, feel like their voices, their experiences have not been brought to the forefront. And so we have a question that just came in from Emily from YouTube that actually touches a little bit of what you were talking about, Tamara. So the question to all of you is, how do you reach young people, both generation, Gen Z and millennials, who have inherited not just the Great Recession, but also the new COVID economic crisis? Young voters who may be so disenchanted by the economic minefield that boomers have left them with huge college debt, limited job prospects, and so many other financial hurdles. So to your earlier point, Shamira, you know, at what point does a millennial have the ability to buy a home and have home ownership? How, how do you motivate a, a whole uh, generation of young people to, to stay engaged relative to the fact of what they, they're inheriting? Oh my God. Well, first of all, I'm a millennial and I am exhausted. I feel like after 9-11, the, uh, the financial crash of 2008, all of these things, right? It just, at, at what point can we get a break? I will say is that um, it's funny when adults, older generations will say that millennials or Gen Zs are entitled, right? Not recognizing that we are our parents' children. Like we are the people that they raised us to be. And our entitlement oftentimes comes from the fact that past generations have taken advantage of government assistant programs that no longer exist because of also the greed of past generations. That being said, I think one of the things that I use to encourage young people is to Zach's point, we are trying to to create a new reality of America that includes you and that enables for you to get the education that you need in the career path that you want and to still be able to 
develop your own version of the American dream that for so long have only been accessible to a very small percentage of the population. Quill, I saw you nodding your head. What are your thoughts to Emily's question? You know, I, I think that, I, I guess, you know, that's not necessarily how, I, I know a lot of millennials and Gen Z who don't necessarily see it that exact same way, but I definitely, um, you know, I definitely recognize that there are a lot of, you know, young people who want to manifest that new reality. Something I, I hear a lot about is the national debt. I mean, that's, you know, and something like Medicare for all, that's, you know, that's something that a lot of my peers are thinking about. But something I did want to bring up was that, uh, you know, on that sort of boomer point, man, that's something that I hear a lot, uh, a lot about from my peers. Um, you know, this this cultural disconnect with older generations. And so, something I've noticed is that as we've had candidates running for Congress who are not quite Zoomers yet, but like Millennials, um, is there's a lot more of a cultural affinity. You know, both in the way that we communicate and sort of our, our cultural touchstones, and you know, have faced those same issues of um, you know college affordability and, and that sort of thing. And so, I think that. Um, as we're seeing these, you know, millennial candidates rise up and emerge as leaders, and hopefully many of them end up in in Congress. I think that that's going to help a lot because there's this um, this shared culture and experience that kind of regardless of political affiliation um, is there. And so I think that that's something that's encouraging and maybe even might result in a bit more in enthusiasm and turnout among young voters. And Abby, are you seeing any of this from a research standpoint in terms of how young people? Um, are looking at their economic future uh, and, and what impact that has in, in their, their level of engagement. Well, I definitely think that's something we should be talking about now because young people have been hit hard by the pandemic and especially according to our analyses, young black folks. And so this has got to be part of the sort of future building that Jamira is talking about, talking about an economy that works for a lot more people. Um, you know, we've seen with the pandemic just unearthing so much inequality that lots of people knew where it was there, um, but has just been laid bare in so many new ways. And so as a result, you know, lots since lots and lots of young people care about that inequality and care about the fundamental fairness of U.S. society and of democracy, you know, that absolutely is a place where you can res it can resonate, you know, with with young voters. And we can look at candidates that that talk about that and how much young people have been, you know, that has resonated with them. So I absolutely think that that is something that can be talked about. But at the same time, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing as as well is that young people are thinking about the intersections with the economy and racial justice. Young people are looking at the intersections with the economy and climate change and the environment. And so this isn't only about one issue, this is about how they all tie together. Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, start with you, Zach, and also come to Jamira. You both have worked on campaigns. Um, given your experience working on campaigns, what have you seen in terms of historically the, the level of enthusiasm previously to where we see ourselves today. We're eight days out. How are you seeing things from, from that vantage point? Start with you, Zach. Yeah, I mean, the level of enthusiasm around the election is historic. Uh, there, there's, there, well, you know what? There's enthusiasm, but there's also like, uh, there's exhaustion. There's a lot of exhaustion right now among young people. Uh, we've, We've seen this content in our feeds for, uh, you know, four years now uh, about the, the importance of, of what's at stake in this election. Um, but are we ready to, to vote? Or are we talking about voting with our peers? Do I have friends who have lived in swing states, who lived in swing states four years ago, who are now finally saying, like, Zach, how do I register to vote? Absolutely. Uh, people who are politically apathetic previously are like saying they recognize the importance of their vote in this moment. I have a friend who had never registered to vote before because he didn't recognize the importance of voting, but in the wake of George Floyd's murder, understood the importance of down ballot elections uh, because he, he while while he uh, has lived in a traditionally blue state, understands that those local elections are really what's going to sway the tide on the issues that matter most to him and his, and his peers. Um, so the the enthusiasm. The enthusiasm is is there, uh, and we're we're ready for it to also be over. <laughs> Jamira, you share that? I, I wouldn't call it enthusiasm. <laughs> I think I don't think it's enthusiasm necessarily for a particular candidate. I think it's enthusiasm for the reality in which they're trying to create, right? So it's enthusiasm for the potential of gun control. It's enthusiasm for the potential of climate change. It's enthusiasm for the potential that we're maybe might find some level of large scale racial justice in this country. 
And I say that to say that I think young people are at a tipping point where they're they're realizing that it's not about um, electing a savior, but really about electing an opponent or a collaborator, someone that you can work with to create the world in which you deserve. And um, sadly enough, I, 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 unfortunately, I say this many times, I think the election of 2018 has ruined elections for a lot of people. Um, not 2018, I'm sorry, 2008, because people expect to have a warm, fuzzy feeling like they did for Barack Obama. And the vast majority of elections aren't like that. And so I do think that we're now at a point where people are being a little bit more strategic and um, who they're gonna vote for versus looking for that aspirational um, candidate. They're looking for an aspirational policy and aspirational aspirational new reality of this country. So there's two questions that have come in that I think both of them are very uh, relevant and pertinent to the conversation. Uh, the first one I'll throw out to the whole group is it's a comment coming from Facebook saying, personally, I think Trump and Biden uh, are too old to run this country and we need a young person for the job. Is the age of the candidate, both of them, an issue? So uh, maybe we'll start uh, after the perennial question about age. Gee, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I, I think I want to raise here is, you know, we get this we get this question about whether or not Canada age matters just about every presidential cycle. Um, and, you know, during midterm elections when people are voting for running for health um, seats. And one of the realities is that there aren't a, there isn't a lot of good data <laughs> for this, um, but when we look at presidential elections, you know, largely young people have supported younger candidates, but um, that isn't necessarily an indicator that that's going to be the case for every single um, type of seat. For example, we've seen a lot of you know younger folks run run for house seats and not win. Right? We saw young people supporting. Um, Senator Sanders in the Democratic primaries, you know, to a great extent. And so, you know, I really want to hone in on something that Jamira just talked about, which is inspirational policy and inspirational issues that affect young people's lives, because that's what we see connect with young people a lot more than just candidate age. And also it matters what a candidate does to actually listen to and hear from young people. Because if you have a young candidate who doesn't want to talk to young people or listen to them, then that's also a deal breaker in, from what we've seen. Quill? What do you think about age? Yeah, I, I can say there. You know, the generational divide is is big, um, particularly when you have candidates where there's a couple generations between them and the <laughs> the new the, the, the new voters, and so that's definitely something that's on my mind and that I've heard a lot about. I hear a lot of enthusiasm for for a candidate like Nikki Haley in 2024 or Dan Crenshaw or somebody like that. So I think it's you know we're not necessarily looking for you know to lower the you know the, the age to run for president, but I think that looking for somebody where there's a little bit closer in age and a bit more of a cultural affinity and understanding of, you know, what issues matter to young voters. And so that's that's what I'm hearing a lot of right now. Um, and I think that in this election in particular, there's just a, a massive ge generational disconnect between first time voters and the, the two candidates who, who made it to the final round. Yeah, uh, and the, the second question that came in from Facebook, which I actually think is quite interesting, particularly for young people, it's one that I've been having a lot of conversations about over the past few days, and that is, um, there's a very real scenario that come Tuesday evening, uh, we may not know the results. And in some cases, the, the, there's uh, yeah. some expectation that um, the election could be called prematurely. And, you know, I guess the question, you know, both in terms of what came from Facebook, is we may not have a president elect on November 3rd. What are your predictions for how people will be feeling or acting? The, the, the kind of added question I want to throw on that is, what level of responsibility is needed at this moment, particularly talking to young people, if this is their first election, that in fact it's okay if we don't get the results the night of, and that there's uh, getting that information out to them now prior to thinking that uh, in fact it's a problem if we don't know the results come late Tuesday night. Um, Zach, let me start that question with you. Well, this, this election is not going to be like any election before. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, unless you were around in 1918, this is this election is not like anything you've experienced before. Um, but I also I want to I actually want to turn back to that last question for a moment uh, because there are a uh, there there. If you look at the average age of a member of Congress, if you look at the average age of a member of state legislatures, you're talking about candidates who are in their mid 50s. Uh, but you also it's not just about age. To Abby's point. 
Andrew Yang said this really well when he was the last candidate of color in the Democratic primary presidential debate stage. Uh, he said that the average net worth of a black family in America is one-tenth that of a white family. The average net worth of a Latino family in America is one-twelfth that of a white family. And so why does that matter? Because, um, because you need an investment from your community in order to be able to run an effective campaign. Uh, unfortunately, money in politics does play a role in the success of candidates. And so when we talk about age, we also have to recognize that the representation of candidates is inhibited by the fact that our campaign finance laws prevent young people of all backgrounds from being able to run successful races. I, I look to young people, these young people, these leaders like Jamira, like Quill, et cetera, uh, to be those who are going to be the voices uh, who are going to bring comfort to young people after this election and, and amid this pandemic. Uh, you know, the, we're going to be the voices with our peers. We're going to say, hey, you know, the, the election results, the, they'll be coming in two to three days. They're not going to be coming on election day. This is a this is a, a conversation we need to be having among each other uh, because truthfully, nobody really knows what to expect. If Texas goes to Biden uh, on January, uh, on November 3rd, this election's over. If Texas doesn't go to Biden on, on November 3rd, we could be waiting a couple days. Yeah. So first of all, I will say that, you know, if 35 is the age to run for president, then maybe we should have a cutoff age who can um, still run for president. But I'll just leave it at that. Um, also, anyone who says the Twitter probably should be running for Congress. Um, another thing I will say is that in regards to this moment and like what can happen on election day, I just did a presentation for a group of millennial influencers. And the thing I tried to address to them is that, you know, the responsibility lies with us in ensuring that one, we're setting a clear expectation that not every election do we have the clear um, a clear winner on election night. Like that's unrealistic, especially when you now have so many people who have now participated in the process and have sent in their mail-in ballots. So trying to normalize the fact that we, we may not have the results on um, the third is, is a reality. And second, I'm trying to ensure that folks are being responsible with the information that they're sharing. There's a lot of false information that's already going around about the legitimacy of the process, about, um, about the suppression that's happening at the polling places. And so asking folks to be diligent in their research of um, links that they share and information that they share, and then also be willing to not, also, to, to not give a result on your platform um, that isn't backed up by a legitimate source of information. So the responsibility does lie with us as young people. If we have a platform, if we have young people who support and agree with us, how do we ensure that we're sending the right information? Because I fear that how we respond on November 3rd and November 4th will either break folks very fragile trust in the system um, and prevent them from wanting to participate in future elections. So if I were to push that just a little bit further, because I think you're absolutely right. How do we make sure that they, they don't be part of the problem of perpetuating misinformation? How would you encourage, and again, I ask you, Jameer, first, but anybody in, in informing young people that how do you know that you're not being manipulated yourself? And in fact, you're sharing information that's only further perpetuating uh, disinformation. Read past the the headline, right? There's so much clickbait that the by the time you actually read the article, it's very different what the headline says. So recognize that there's a lot of clickbait out there. So read the headline, find out what the news source is, question whether or not the news source from your past experience is a legitimate one, right? And then also, do they have motives for writing the narrative that they do? Also, I've always, especially when folks write about racial justice, I click on who the author is. The vast majority of the time is not a person of color, so I always question those facts. Um, and then also look at more than one source and then ask folks within your network about the information that you that you are receiving before making um, a decision. And also, there's power in not saying anything at all. If you don't have all the information, if you don't have all the facts, there's also power in just being silent and to folks that you do trust with more information can come forth and give a clearer picture of what's happening. Anybody else thoughts on this? Yeah, I just I just say that, you know, over the last four years, um, we've heard a lot of very dramatic rhetoric. And I think that all of us are, um, you know, very nervous about this election, and particularly young people. I see this in climate change as well, um, you know, sort of in the climate movement that this is often framed as, you know, the make or break election in terms of addressing climate change. Now, I don't want to diminish the fact that this is a very important election when it comes to a lot of important issues. But, you know, we as young people have been told again and again and again that, 
you know, it's every everything is do or die or make or break. And I, I don't want to take away from the significance of this election. But I think at the same time, um, you know, we've been fed a lot of information that would make us even more nervous and has not given us much pause and, um, you know, reassurance that we do have a very resilient system. We have a constitutional democracy and that, um, you know, while this is a difficult time that we will make this through. And so I see that in the, in the climate movement. I, I hope that as we go into this election that we can reassure young people that we will make it through this. And I want to turn it now in our final, you know, 10 minutes or so here uh, to post-election, kind of where we're going from here, how uh, uh, not only the, the youth voter turnout in this election uh, plays out, but also where we go. But before I do, I guess one question I would have is we think about what has failed young people to this point. Which issues do you think that were just simply not addressed by either candidate, either party, in any meaningful way going into this election and will likely continue to be a priority for young people uh, in 2020 and beyond? Ravi? I'd love to turn it to the young people first. All right, I'll, Quill. I'm <laughs> Which is not me. <laughs> You're young at heart, Abby. You're young yeah. at heart. Quill, I'm going to come back to you first on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that college affordability is something that we could definitely hear more about. Um, that's, you know, what a lot of, that's the, the first big issue a lot of young people are facing as they're becoming adults. And so I think that that's something that um, both sides need to engage on more. Um, I would also say that on a, a number of issues, you know, from the left, you often have this super, super aspirational rhetoric. And on the right, you have sometimes denialist rhetoric. I'm thinking about climate change right now. Young people want real solutions. You know, I, I think that we want to have a, a good discussion where both sides come to the table and hash out real solutions that'll work. Um, and on a lot of issues, you know, one side owns the issue and the other side sort of ignores it. Um, and I think that there's a whole host of different things where young people would like to be able to um, hear both sides and figure out where the, you know, the realistic, effective solution is somewhere in the middle. Jamira? A lot of the work I do is around workforce development, um, and which kind of alludes to Quill's points around college affordability. But even before then, we're now faced with the largest youth population the world has ever seen. The vast majority of them are not on track to receive the skills they need in order to work in the fourth industrial revolution, which is going to be overtaken by automation and robotics. And so I would love a candidate who talks about what does it look like to um, to reevaluate how our school systems is training young people to be able to enter the workforce in a more substantial way. And Zach? Yeah, I totally want to echo Jamira. Like, that's exactly what I was going to say. We need a real economic vision for young people. Um, and at the same time, I actually think that this election is do or die in many ways for young people. Um, you know, the, the thing is, change takes a long time to happen. That's the reality. Like, when you elect a president, it, tomorrow, tomorrow, it's not like everyone gets free health care, right? If Bernie Sanders were president. It takes time. And so I'm uh, going to be 27 years old. Well, OK, Joe Biden's presidency is going to take three years, 31. Like, you know, life's moving on. Things are moving quickly. People are dying because they don't have access to health care because there's, you know, we have, we have bad gun 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 restrictions in our country or gu gun policies in our country, I should say. Uh, people are dying. My friend just lost his house to, to wildfires in California. Uh, stuff's happening. And we do need to make sure that, that, that those issues get addressed uh, in this election. But ultimately, uh, you know, James, I think it was James Carville who said it, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, we do need to make sure that young people have jobs so that they can build stronger communities. And right now with the COVID crisis, you know, we're struggling. Uh, and I think there's a good, in many ways, you set it off quite well. I think the last question for all of you that I want to pose and give a, you know, a chance for each of you to kind of end on is, what is your message to young people beyond election day? You know, and as you were talking, Zach, the one thing that keeps coming to mind for me is that there's so many issues at stake for them. Um, and yet we do spend more often than not too much time discussing the presidential election and what impact that has and not enough of understanding that, again, the way that our system works, that if certain things don't uh, change in our House or in our Senate in the way that they're, they're working together, you're simply at a standstill. So all these big ideas and then young people inherently get, um, you know, they lose motivation over a period of time to say, okay, well, we got out there, we tried to make change. And you saw that at, at times, whether it was in the Obama administration. So again, more broadly to each one of you, like, what's your message to young people beyond 2020, beyond this presidential election? Abby, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, thank you so much. So 
we've certainly learned over the past 50 years what's not working. Um, we have an ad hoc system of small d democratic participation where we largely kind of leave it up to people to figure out how to participate for themselves. And we cannot just leave that up to young people. The future of democracy depends on it. Um, and we can't put both the future of the country and the future of democracy generally on young people's shoulders. And so I believe that, you know, older generations can make can be influenced by young people to make changes to systems and structures that have a large influence on whether or not young people have opportunities. We can start earlier. We talk a lot about growing voters in the context of an election, but this also applies to other types of engagement. We also need to make sure that there's opportunities to participate that are visible, accessible, and meaningful to diverse young people, not just the older folks who perceive access because they've been part of the these systems for so long. And there's roles for media that provide to provide actionable information and uplift diverse youth voices for K-12 schools to actually teach about things like, you know, what it means to live in a democracy and so many other stakeholders. Um, and all of this is important to amplify diverse young people's voices and support youth leadership because it's good for communities, for young people to do this community problem solving. So I think that there's a huge opportunity in this moment when so many young people are engaged for them to tap on some older folks shoulders and say hey you know what you're making this a little bit harder we can't totally do this entirely by ourselves when you look at 2018 and 2020 young people have been making space for themselves and taking space and adults older folks can make that a lot easier on young people quill yeah i would say that um and and this is this is something that I think is important for a lot of young people to hear, and they, they know it, is that we're not a monolith. Gen Z and, and, and um, uh, millennials, we're not, we're not a monolith. There are many young people out there who strongly support the Second Amendment. There's a lot of young people out there protesting, making sure, um, you know, supporting uh, Amy Coney Barrett um, and her spot on, uh, on the Supreme Court. Now, we may disagree on these issues, right? And, and those, you know, opinions are, are represented across the spectrum among young voters. But the important thing, and I think this is a, lot, a thing that is important for us as young people to embrace is that we don't have to sacrifice our principles in order to get things done. You know, I may be a conservative, Zach may be more on the left, but there are certain things that we do agree upon um, and we can work together and get them done. Uh, and I think that that's something that a lot of, you know, young people are not hearing because we're particularly um, uh, siloed in terms of our friends, even though we hear a lot from, you know, different people on social media, but in terms of our friend groups, we're kind of siloed. Uh, and then just the last thing I'll say is that we've been told that the, the system is, is set up against us and the boomers ruined everything. And, you know, so there, there's some things that they, they messed up pretty bad. But at the same time, wow, like we are, you know, we have millennials who are running for Congress right now. Uh, we've been out on the streets. We've been calling for action on climate change and action on racial justice, and it's making a difference. And so, there's a lot stacked up against us, but at the same time, I think we need to reject this notion um, that we have no power, because we do, we have a lot of power. Zach, parting words. Yeah, for, I mean, for those of us who have the privilege of having a platform like this, I think it's incumbent upon us to also uplift the voices of those who don't have a platform uh, like this. And so for those young leaders who, who might be listening today, uh, who might be working on campaigns, it's our, our responsibility, perhaps our privilege, uh, to, to be able to uplift and, and engage voices that are left out of the process. Um, that, that too often, you know, young people, they, they get the spotlight and then they, they take it away from all of those other young people out there who are really struggling, who don't have that, those platforms. And so I think we need to uplift those. The, the other thing I'd say those to our allies, um, don't discount the role that young people play in actually influencing older folks' votes and older folks' actions. I saw this uh, working on campaigns where older folks would say, well, I'm not so sure I want to support your candidate or support your issue if I don't see young people rallying around it. And I always say that young people are the ones who lead move movements. Young people will always lead. They won't follow old people. Old people will follow young people. And so we need young people to drive us into the next four years uh, and beyond on the issues that matter most. And I think we'll, uh, we'll see our, our political leaders rally around them. Jamira, I'm going to give you the last word. Voting is not the end all be all. It is one of the tools within our toolbox in order to create the world that we all want and deserve. That being said, there's no age requirement to change the world. So if you see something, do something, say something. Well, I want to thank, first of all, our panelists, Abby, uh, Zach, 
Quill and Jamira, thank you. Thank you to 92nd Street Y for again, hosting this event. And on behalf of now, just wanna thank all of you who tuned in, watched this. And I think we end with the parting words, make sure you go and vote. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.